What is going on, everybody? Welcome to episode three of Lessons in Leviya. So as you can notice, we have a little bit of a different camera situation set up on this one. Instead of the camera pointed at my beautiful face, I have it pointed at my board state because I do want to go over the most recent iteration of my deck. I want to talk about how it is heavily influenced by Jason Chung's uh, deck list from the Devastation series going on that LSS is putting out on the Flesh and Blood TCG YouTube channel. And then I'm going to show you the cards that I have different. So I figured it'd be more practical for me to show some cards on the table. While you look at the list on the screen, I can tell you what I substitute in and out, what I liked, what I didn't like, rather than staring at me, staring at you every once in a while. <laughs> so, first things first, if you have not checked out the Dev A Station series on the uh, Flesh and Blood TCG YouTube channel, go and do that. I will link it to this video underneath in the description. They are running a tournament where all the uh, developers are playing against each other. They all picked different heroes. And it's extremely educational. It gives you some insight onto how to play that hero, maybe some angles on how to build that hero's classic constructed deck that you weren't um, you know, ne necessarily seeing out in the, uh, in the public eye. So Leviah being a, an extremely um, undefined character and what she does or what she does well this series helped me a lot because not only do they show the gameplay of the two developers playing they then follow that up with a uh, deck tech video of of the two decks that were involved in the in the match so jason goes over his leviah deck in a very brief little eight minute description on how he thinks the deck is supposed to function and what cards really shine in it. So of course me being the Leviya addict that I am and having his list be so vastly different than my defensive one, I was extremely intrigued. So I instantly had to put it together, build it, play it, play it, play it, test it, see how I liked it. And then if I did like it, make some tweaks. So the first thing we're going to talk about on this episode is his list. After we talk about his list, we're going to talk about my list and the changes I made to his list. And then I'm going to update you on my defensive build as well, because I don't want to leave that um, what we've been building in the previous two episodes just kicked to the curb just because we got some some spicy new um, Leviya, you know, outlooks coming from the developers. So... First things first, If as you can see on the big portion of your screen, we have Jason's Levia deck that he played in the Devastation Tournament. First you'll notice he uses two Mandible Claws, the Evenfold Helmet, or the head I should say, the Scabskin Leathers, the Skullhorn for the Kano matchup, the Gambler's Gloves, the Nolrune ro Robe for the Kano matchup, and then the bark bone strapping. So he he says in his video, which you should go watch, is that he likes the even fold for the utility, and sometimes it can just help you to not die from blood debt. He likes the resources generation that bark bone can get you, and plus it has a block of one. And then obviously he states how critical the scabskin leathers are for this build. And, and actually all Leviya builds, to be honest. So if you are going to try to go and get yourself a legendary and you are interested in playing Leviya, you should go ahead and buy yourself a scabskin leathers because it is absolutely necessary. And then if you're going to play with the scabskin leathers, you're going to also need the gambler's gloves. And luckily, we got some uh, Crucible of War Unlimited coming out uh, very soon. So hopefully you can get some Gambler's Gloves at a cheaper cost than what they're going out there now for. And that is his equipment slate. What I did differently after testing with his, uh, his list in the initial couple runs was... Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> Whew! 
Uh, I'm not cutting it either. Real life scenarios. So I swapped out the bark bone strapping for the carrion husk. The husk is just too good. Um, in my opinion, the block six is almost great against every hero, whether you have to use it for a four, five, or six block, at, at, depending on when. It also helps by putting cards, uh, it's, a, it's a free blood deck card, which sounds silly, you don't want it, but you really turn off blood deck well in this list, and um, you can, it helps either get to the six you need for Blasma Fed, or momentarily here when we talk about um, the hex score that I have on the on my portion of the screen. So I swapped out the bark bone strapping for the carrion husk. Now that is another legendary. If you don't have the carrion husk, the bark bone strapping is a solid play. And then also the even fold, um, even though it does have that instant to destroy it, banish a card from your hand. If it's a shadow card, draw a card with the spell void of two. I just found the utility of the Arcanite skull cap to be better. Again, this is another expensive legendary card. So if you don't have it, go ahead and play the even fold. But for maximum efficiency, I switched over to the Arcanite Skullcap, and I really like it. And then you'll also notice I put the Hexagor, the Death Hydra, down here underneath my Mandible Claws. And that's because the Claws come in great as a utility at there are times in a turn where you will do a lot of damage, your Blood Rush Bellows, your Art of War turns, whatever combos you might have, your Shadow of Blasma Fat, and you will even give the Claws the ability to gain go again at times because you can discard a 6 on a turn in a bunch of different ways. However, I found myself playing attack action cards and then maybe using one Claw and so I felt like this deck was more efficiently suited for the Hexagore because it does a good job of playing cards and not really relying on the meat axe like we did in the previous versions of our deck. And so I said to myself, well, I want to test the Hexagore with this style of deck. And I, I think it's going to be very good. I haven't had much experience with it yet because I've wanted to fully give the Mandible Claws their time to shine and see if i really liked it excuse me however i think the the hexagore fits into this build which i cannot express to you how happy that sentence coming out of my mouth makes me feel because i thought it was almost like a dead weapon and uh so that is his that is his equipment that you see on your screen and then on my little screen is what i've swapped out as far as um my equipment compared to his so we're gonna scroll down now and look at some of his cards in his deck list now you can watch him go over this deck list in that video that i'll link to this video so i want to just briefly talk about it and i'm going to point out some things that you'll notice that were vastly different than what we were doing um in the or what i was i shouldn't say we what i was doing in my previous builds so we got the boneyards that's the same. The Dread Screamers, that's the same. The Endless Moss. He plays one Ghostly Visit to utilize that ability to play it out of the Banished Zone, costing one attacking for four, blocking for three. He plays two Guardian of the Shadow Realms, which I believe he only sideboards in against Warrior. And then three Shadow of Blasma Fets, which previously did not fit our last iteration because it did not defend and only sometimes turned off blood debt. But if you use the ability on the shadow of Blasma Fett to go and get you a card that doesn't necessarily turn off blood debt, but puts a card into your banish zone that could be played that turn. Um, the, the card is better than I thought when you pair it, when you use it to go find um, things that can be played within that same turn uh he plays one void wraith costs two attacks for five blocks for three you can play this from your banished zone and three tome of torments i have never changed my tune on a card that i previously thought was not good so fast in this game so like i used to think this card sucked i didn't see the utility for it 
Um, it was like one of the Majestics I would be sad if I pulled. And now, watching how Jason used it and then playing with it and feeling the strength of it, especially when you have the ability on the scab skin leathers to gain action points, it is outstanding. So the Tome of Torment says, uh, you may play this from your banished zone, draw a card. Now, the great thing about Leviah is we have ways to continue to cycle this into our Banished Zone, from Graveyard to Banished Zone, from Graveyard to Banished Zone. So you can continuously play this card throughout the game. Now, you're going to want to play it on turns where you roll a 6 or, or, or um, 5 or 4 on the pants because it's important to try to draw that card. If you don't have the two action points to attack, you can attack, then draw a card, Arsenal, and go on because having an arsenal card in this deck seems to be amazing. And so the Tome of Torment has been a great addition. It's usually what I go and find with the Shadow of Blasmafat. Um, is a is at least a Tome of Torment. And then we'll talk about the differences in my list compared to his. I just want to talk about his list and then we'll talk about the cards in mine. We uh, already addressed the equipment, but we'll talk about the cards in a second. Two Howls from Beyond, which I was not running in mine. He does run the red and the yellow Hungering Slaughter Beast, so no change there. Three Nourishing Emptiness. Now, originally I thought to myself, this card's going to be horrible because we're blocking um, and we're going to have attack action cards in our graveyard almost all the time. However, what the big difference between the way he plays this deck and the way that I've learned to play this deck now is he is not shy to... Um, start playing cards that say banish three to turn off blood debt when he has only, you know, three, four, five cards in his graveyard. So what he likes to do and what he says in his video is he can play a card like a Dread Screamer, which will banish three, clear out those, um, clear out those attack action cards. Dread Screamer has go again, and then you play a Nourishing Emptiness and you get the clause to go off on it that says, while there are no attack action cards in your graveyard, Nourishing Emptiness gains Dominate, and if this hits a hero, gain plus one hand size until the end of your turn. So that's actually a great addition, and the more I've done it and played with it, the more I've liked it. Beast Within is the same. He runs two red unmovables for the warrior Dorinthia matchup. Three Commanding Conquers, which I took out of my version in the past because I didn't feel like it met, meshed with the archetype. But, still a great card. If you don't own it, though, not a big deal. Three Blood Rush Bellows, which I probably should have been playing in the past. But, at the time when we were, uh, when I was testing that more defensive build... I didn't see the value of it, but now definitely I do. The drawing of the two cards, the getting the plus two, and then um, and, and then the go again can be outstanding, especially with the claws if you're playing the claws because then they attack for five each. However, even without the claws, just to play a card and then have another action point, maybe swing the hexagore for six, seven, eight, is still outstanding. And then... Um, Three Art of Wars, which was a card I've used in the past, but I also took out because it didn't block, and I thought we were trying to get too cute at times, but has been playing excellent in this version of this deck. He plays two Arg Smashes for the dash matchup, three Mark of the Beasts, three Deep Rooted Evils, which I used to hate because the, the no block cost three, doesn't turn off blood debt, but... You can play it out of the Banished Zone if you've banished a 6 that turn. Three Blue Deadwood Rumblers, which we've done in the past. Three Reckless Swings Blue, which I've done in the past. Three Unworldly Bellows, which we've had. Three Mutated Masses in his version. Uh, it can be played out of the Banished Zone. It costs 1, and its attack value and defense value is twice the number of cards in your pitch zone with different costs. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. It doesn't always work out when you have it. Um, but he, he likes it in his deck. One Doomsday, one Soul Harvest, and three Wrecker Roms. So if you want to watch him explain his version on this Leviah Clause that he has built, like again, I said before, the link is going to be in the description. Now, let's switch over. I'll tell you my experiences with this, what I've changed, and what I like about it, um, and why I think it is 
outstanding and why I'm so happy they released this video because it really got my uh, creative brain, brain flowing and a different way to look at Leviah. So I'm going to click over to my build now and then um, I'll show you on my little mini camera what I've changed out. So we've talked about the equipment. I like to play instead of uh, two com or three Command and Conquers. I only play two of them in the deck. Uh, obviously an outstanding card. We, we know how great it is. I don't think you need all three. Um, it doesn't, you know, turn on a banish or, or do, do much else for us, but obviously a really strong card, especially with more than one action point, play a card to turn off blood debt. And then if you have those two resources left over in another action point, command and conquer is excellent. I went down to two tomes of torment. I did say how outstanding this card is in this deck. The reason why I went down to two was because it can be played from the banish zone, so you cycle it. And then secondly, you can go and find it with Shadow of Blasmophet. So since we can go and find it and, and banish it with Shadow of Blasmophet, I don't think I need to run three. I'm more comfortable with just running two. And so that's a change that I've made. Um, I played two red writhing beast hulks which is not in his list at all in any capacity. So you can credit those two red writhings of minus one command and conquer and minus one nourishing emptiness, which I'll bring up right now. So we have the two command and conquers, two nourishing emptiness, two tomes of torment, two writhing beast hulks. We minus one from each of these and we added two red writhing beast hulks. I feel like it does a little bit more for us. Um, you know, you can gain Dominate. You can use it to turn off Blood Debt. I think it's just as fits fits just as well as if we had a third Nourishing or a third Command and Conquer. It probably raises our floor, lowers our ceiling. But it's something I've enjoyed and I've liked playing with these past couple of days. And then my other changes. I play two yellow Graveling Growls, um, and the reason why I picked these yellow Graveling Growls is because I don't play um, the two Arg Smash. Um, I'm not too worried about Dash right now at the moment. I don't see a lot of her in my local play scene. Um, if you were probably preparing for a tournament and you thought Dash was going to be heavily represented then you would, yes, want those two ARG smashes. Um, I also don't own any, so the two uh, yellow graveling growls got put in instead of the two ARG smashes. And then a big change here is I do not play the three um, uh, mutated mass. I don't... I feel like that card's kind of clunky... I seem to always draw it when I don't need it. Yes, it's a blue pitch, which is awesome. But for a non-six, I don't think it offers as much upside. So what I swapped it with um, compared to his list was three yellow uh, Dread Screamers. So obviously I really like Dread Screamer. I feel like it offers a lot for us, especially with the go again. So yes, it's one less resource pitch. Um, and it does cost one more, but I, I think it's just better. I haven't missed Mutated Mass after playing with it and then swapping it out for these Yellow Dread Screamers. And then lastly, let me clear this off now. I don't play three um, Deep Rooted Evils. I only play two of them. Again, if a card can be played from the Banished Zone... I don't mind just running two copies since we can always again see it later and it can be searched and found with a shadow of Blasmophet. So I don't really see the need to run three and in most matchups it doesn't defend. So in some match, not most, but in some matchups you even sideboard it out. So it's not in your deck. So I, instead of taking up three slots, I used it for two and then I replaced the ghostly visit the one ghostly visit 
and the one Void Wraith with uh, two Luna Tried Plunderers. Because Luna Tide Plunderer. Luna Tide Plunderer. Because I like it against the two light heroes. It can be sideboarded in and out. It does block if you need it to. Three for six, and if it hits, banish it and one card from their soul. So it can turn off Blood Debt. Can take a card out of a defending hero's soul if you're playing against one of those light heroes. And so then we also get two more pitch value out of it. Now, sure, we can't... The uh, the Ghostly Visit and the uh, Void Wraith can be played out of Banish Zone. But I don't really care too much about playing those out of Banish Zone. Um, we have a lot of ways to to still do tricks out of our Banish Zone with the Tome of Torment, the Deep-Rooted Evils, the Howl from Beyonds. Um, what else can we play out of our Banish Zone? I think that's it. The... Going and getting a guardian uh, of the shadow realm. Yeah, so the howls, the tomes, the deep rooted evils can all be played out of our banished zone. So I I haven't really missed not having that option to go and f get a void wraith in my banished zone and use it for two for five. Especially if we have a second action point left. And let's say our Hexagore is going to swing for six. We'd much rather pay the two to swing for six if we've already turned off blood that, that turn. Um, and so then the one deep-rooted evil that is missing um, is our Hexagore slot. And so those were the changes I made. Um, I will also link my list um, on this video as well. So we subbed out one Command and Conquer and one Nourishing for two Red Writhing Beast Hulks. We minused one um, Deep Rooted Evil for a Hexagore. We minus the two Arg Smash for the Graveling Growl. We play the Lunatride Plunderers instead of the two red play from the Banished Zone Shadow cards. And then, I don't know what I... I can't off the top of my head notice here what I... Rep I took out a Tome of Torment, so that means there's got to be another card in here somewhere that I can't think of the top of my head with the blue the blue um excuse me the blue uh mutated masses are swapped out for the um yellow dread screamers and i think that's that's it i can't recall what i took out that tome and what's what's replaced it but i'm sure somebody will notice in the comments and let me know so yeah, uh, I like this list. Now the way that I've been playing it is very similar to how I watched him play it in the video and the more experience you get with it, the better it will feel. You kind of stay aggressive more so than defensive. You, you can still defend, but you want to be playing these attacks that banish three and then freeing up your graveyard or you know taking it down a little bit and not being shy to not have that many cards in your graveyard. You want to use things like Shadow of Blasma Fett to go get a Tome of Torment, a Deep-Rooted Evil, a Howl from Beyond, something that you can play out of your Banished Zone. And then the Blood Rush Bellow and the Art of War is kind of like our drawing cards play and our, our way to increase damage or gain an action point. And that's been outstanding. Mark of the Beast has been better than expected. Sometimes I am blocking with it now because I don't mind having the blood debt. Um, especially when we're playing with the Hexagore or trying to spawn out Blasmafet. And then you'll notice that um, the only major difference is he plays just the blue Unworldly Bellows, which can turn off blood debt and buff an attack by two, a shadow or a brute attack by two, whereas I was playing the yellows and the blues and sometimes even the reds. And so it's a little bit less important. Most of our cards already kind of come with the Claws of Banishing or have a way to turn off Blood Debt. So I haven't found myself dying to Blood Debt in this version. I haven't done that yet. Um, knock on wood, hopefully it, it keeps going. But I've really, really, really liked this um, this version. So, again, 
Here's my list. I'll link it. Um, what else has really stood out? Like I said, the nourishings, the howls have felt great. The tomes, the getting the howls and the tomes back into the banished zone after you play them is feels really strong. The shadow of Blasma Fed has been better because we go and find a card. Um, oh, this is my old one. I have three Beast Hulks in here. And I don't think that's... Oh, maybe I do play three Beast Hulks. And that's where that extra Tome of Torment is coming from. That's probably what I do. I have three Beast Hulks, and, and there's where that one card is missing. Um, other than that, give it a shot. Play with it. Feel it out and tell me how you like it. Watch his video. Watch the game of him playing the other developer. It's outstanding. And then finally, keep it quick here, is the defensive build we were working on. This doesn't mean I've like thrown that out the window. I just wanted to try something new. And I felt like the defensive build that I had has been playing better than it was in the past. And I did change some things up. So I'm going to pull that up on the screen here. So for that defensive build, we had a lot more equipment, which I can go back and edit now. Because um, against Chain, I have found it less and less relevant to even play a uh, Arcane Barrier 1. I'm just going to try to fight him back. Um, and not really block him as much as I used to and not be so scared of the arcane damage. Um, but here was our updated defensive list. Two lots of Boneyard Marauder, the Reds and the Blues, the whole lot of Dread Screamers, um, Reds and Yellow Graveling Growls, the Hungering Slaughter Beast Reds and Yellows, our Maws stayed the same, all of the Unworldly Bellows, the Yellow and Blue Convulsions, Pack Hunt, Writhing Beast Talk, Beast Within, Lunatride Plunderer, Lunatride Tide. I always say that wrong. Mark of the Beast, Riled Up, Deadwood Rumbler, Doomsday Soul Harvest, and Wrecker Romp. So this version allows you to block more, play more conservatively, bide your time, and then go off towards the end, which we've discussed in the past, which I'll also link this in the video description as the defensive build. And I'll update the dates for you. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of come in and touch base with you guys. Especially after that recent um, Devastation video and Deck Tech. Levi has been a lot of fun these last couple of days. So get out there. Get those claws or that Hexagore together. And try out that new version. You probably have to work out some kinks. It'll take some reps. Um, you play it a lot different than the defensive one with the Meat Axe. But I think it's more fun. So uh, until next time, take care. Jim from the Roundtable of Wraith is signing out. Later, guys.